First of all, I want to thank Trees Atlanta and their partners who have come out this morning in East Atlanta. We're quite near the village, and this is a very established community with a lot of old growth trees, but we need to replace trees and we need to increase our tree canopy. And so what's happening today through Plant Atlanta is an opportunity for the tree canopy to increase uh, in this area. We're planting trees in the public right-of-way and I'm so happy that Trees Atlanta is not only going to educate neighbors on the proper way to plant trees and to take care of trees, but they're going to come back and continue to maintain them until they're strong enough for nature and for neighborhood volunteers to take over. Yeah, I'm out here with uh, residents of Ponce Highland and along with folks, good folks at Trees Atlanta, uh, planting trees here in the neighborhood, but also we're doing this all over the city, uh, which is important to our tree canopy and continuing to make our neighborhoods uh, shady and, and lovely so we're planting i don't know probably 50 60 trees and a couple streets here and uh, it's great to see so many people out engaged in the neighborhood i've been telling the folks out here today that they're poets uh, because one of my favorite quotes about trees is from the poet Khalil gibran who said uh, trees are the poems that the earth writes upon the sky and so uh, everyone today is is planting a tree that will one day be a backdrop on the sky when we look up and so we're all a little bit um, doing our role to be poets today in the Ponce Highland and across the city. We were surprised by the rain, I will tell you that. So we don't have to add the water because Mother Nature provided the water for us today. It's raining and it's fine because trees love rain. So today, Council District 11, which is myself and our entire team, we're here planting 40 trees at Over Greenbrier here. Mill. And that's in partnership with Trees Atlanta. And the reason is, is because Atlanta is known as the city in the forest. And my district, District 11, has the second most beautiful canopy, the largest canopy in the city of Atlanta. So we wanna preserve that. We wanna make sure that every opportunity that we get, we are planting more trees and we're taking care of the ones that we already have. So that's what we're doing today. And the community has joined us. They registered and they joined us and we're planting these trees over at Greenbrier Mill. Yeah, so we've got a uh, tree planting here today by Trees Atlanta for the city of Atlanta. And I think it's really appropriate given that we are in Atlanta, the city in a forest. So we're helping to make the forest uh, even bigger here in Atlanta. I uh, actually planted trees with Trees Atlanta a lot in the past. I remember planting about um, 15 years ago in Chastain Park and it's fun to go by and see those trees and how they've grown in 15 years. And this is about quality of life. This is about uh, making sure that we are green and that we remain that uh, city in a forest. At the end of today, we would have planted over 500 trees in the city of Atlanta, consisting of every single council district. We're here at Westview Cemetery along the ML King Jr. Drive corridor, and we are so happy that Trees Atlanta has chosen this spot, Westview Cemetery, to plant over 40 trees today. We're here with over 100 volunteers. Trees are vital to oxygen. We depend on them for wildlife. And we are so happy to have planted over 500 trees at the end of today, celebrating Plant Atlanta here in the city of Atlanta. I want to thank Trees Atlanta and all of their magnificent staff and volunteers for being here. I'm Phyllis Jackson. Welcome to Stay at Home Connect. Coronavirus cases up now in every single state in the country, placing a major strain on our nation's hospitals and ICUs, as well as frontline medical staff. The CDC now projecting 30,000 additional deaths by Thanksgiving. Gwinnett County ranking second in the state for coronavirus cases. I caught up with Dr. Audrey Arona, the director of the Department of Public Health for Gwinnett, Rockdale and Newton counties. We have seen an increase, a slight increase in the 14 day case rates and positivity. Um, and so that does concern us, of course, but um, you know, the real message lies in 
uh, what we have to do to stop that uptick right now. And I believe that a lot of it may just be due to, to COVID fatigue. We're just so tired of hearing about all this, but it could not be more important uh, to continue the preventive messages that we know work and are the only things that we have at this stage to work against the spread of this virus. And that is social distance, wearing a mask, washing your hands, staying home when you're sick, staying away from other people who are sick. Um, and of course, get the flu shot this time of year so that we don't have that add on, on to our, our current situation. The median age for cases is 38. Dr. Arona says these numbers should remind us all that this is an incurable virus. There is no vaccine, and the only treatment available is for the most seriously ill patients. It has to be given intravenously during a hospitalization. As cases surge in Michigan, those who enjoy dinner or drink at an area restaurant or bar will need to leave more than a tip. Officials with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services want their phone numbers. Patrons are required to provide the information for contact tracing in the event they are exposed to someone infected with coronavirus. Similar protocols have also been set up in New York State. Atlanta City Council member Marcy Collier Overstreet joins Invest Atlanta for the District 11 Small Business Lending Webinar. That's a wrap. We'll see you on the next edition of Stay at Home Connect. I was just blessed to be able to be on the wall, not knowing that I was going to be here until a couple of days ago, and somebody sent me a photograph. But I mean, you know, I knew Hattie Watkins, who is the mother of Willie Watkins, and who helped to get the funeral home here in West End. So most of the people on the wall are people that I know, people that I've worked with. So. These are people that have been committed to the West End and Westview communities. But even with that, they've been committed overall to the city of Atlanta in terms of making this city better. And I don't know of any other place, now that I'm going through my mind, where there, there are women that are being honored. So this is truly uh, something great here in this city. Since yesterday, we lost an additional 31 lives for a total of 9,418 deaths. These are people who started with us in 2020 and won't be with us at the Thanksgiving table. Her emotion resonating with a nation caught in the throes of this pandemic. Dr. Ngaze Izike turning away from the cameras to gather her thoughts. Dr. Izike took some time out to speak with me about that moment and the virus's impact on the state of Illinois. What touched you? What was specifically so significant about that reading uh, during that time last week? You know, I, I wish there was a way to, to exactly pinpoint it and, and explain exactly where that came from. Obviously, this has been welling up for, for months uh, and months and months. And so, you know, in retrospect, I, I guess I would say it's, you know, the culmination of all the things you talked about, the, the frustration uh, the anxiety, the pain, uh, a little bit of anger, to be quite frank, just bubbling up to the surface at just uh, a very public time. I uh, wouldn't have ever um, wished for something like that to happen in such a public moment, but I'm just overwhelmed by the um, support and just everyone feeling like that cathartic release was for, for everyone, that we're all feeling the same. As colder temperatures descend upon the state, Dr. Azike says Illinois is seeing steady increases in test positivity rates, hospitalizations, and deaths. Dr. Azike says the 20-somethings represent the highest case rates. As recently as last week, we had an 18-year-old succumb to this uh, virus, a, a healthy 18-year-old. So I know the, the statistics, uh, but it's kind of like playing a game of Russian roulette where, 
you know, you don't know if you will be that one. And so why don't we all take the stance of preventing it? We cannot control this situation without masking and distancing. We can not. Dr. Ezeke and her team have been passionately fighting against this virus, believing that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Although many are suffering from pandemic fatigue, she says the virus has not grown weary. And we have to be more vigilant than ever, especially as we approach Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. The Illinois Department of Health has a travel advisory map that provides case rates by state. I have had visits with loved ones where we had to be masked the entire time. I couldn't hug my own mother. I just had a brief visit, mask, distance, no touching. That's not how anybody wants it, but that's how it had to be this time. And we both understood that because I love my mother that much that I don't want to risk giving her uh, a, an unthinkable, an unthinkable gift. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, this is Lynn Archibong, Chair of the City Utilities Committee meeting. Today is November, 20, 20, November 10th, 2020, and we are ready to commence, and so I call this meeting to order. Um, Mr. Evans, would you please do a roll call of members? Yes, uh, Council Member Andrea L. Boone. Present. Council Member Dustin Hillis. Here. Council Member J.P. Matsukite. Here. 
Council Member Joyce Shepard. Present. Council Member Howard Shook. Aye. Council Member Cleta Winslow. Present. All members are present, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Evans. Uh, and before you read the remote meeting statement, let me just do a, a check. I understand, Ms. Boone, you will be a voice vote today? Correct. And Ms. Winslow? I will be a voice vote as well. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, great. Um, Mr. Evans, please read the remote meeting statement. Thank you. This City Utilities Committee is being conducted remotely as advertised and in accordance with OCGA 5014-1. The meeting will be conducted in conformance with Robert's Rules of Order and the Rules of Council as authorized by the City Code. The public may access the meeting by dialing 877-579-6743. Conference ID 831-599-1256, which was noted on the Friday, November 6th public meeting notice. The public may also view the meeting on Channel 26, the Council's homepage at citycouncil.atlantaga.gov, the Council's YouTube channel, or the Council's Facebook and Twitter pages via at ATL Council. All presentations are available and on the Atlanta City Council City Utilities Committee presentation page. The agenda was published and made available Friday, November 6th via atlantacityga.iqm2.com. Additionally, the public was able to submit comments via voicemail at 404-330-6057 between the hours of 4 and 7 p.m. on the day before this meeting. These comments will be played during the public comment portion of the meeting. All persons present on the remote council meeting conference bridge are requested to mute your phones and speakers Additionally, speakers must be acknowledged by the presiding officer prior to speaking. Each council member is requested to open your Outlook email and minimize the screen. Amendments, substitutes, and informational documents have been distributed to the committee members beforehand. Thank you all in advance for your cooperation. All right, thank you, Ms. Evans, for reading that. Our next order of business is the adoption of the agenda. I understand we do not have any walk-in papers, is that correct? That is correct. I'm sorry, I will entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So move, Shook. Thank you. I'll second that. Uh, if there are no other unreadiness indicators, please open that vote. The vote is open. Uh, Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? In favor. Ms. Boone, how do you vote? Yes. All right. Thank you. Vote is closed. Seven yeas. All right. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Next, a motion for the approval of the minutes, please. So moved, sure. Thank you. I'll second that motion. If there's no one readiness, please open the vote. The vote is open. Thank you, Ms. Boone. How do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Winslow. How do you vote? Yes. Yes. Thank you. The vote is closed. Seven yes. Awesome. So the minutes stand approved. Next under section F, public comment. Mr. Evans, do we have any public comment? We do. We have about 33 minutes of public comment. All right. Uh, please commence that process of playing those messages. My name is David Holder and I live in the Mechanicsville community. I am a voter. I am calling because I'm concerned that the city removed key languages from the post-development stormwater order that currently intensifies green infrastructure and requires the extended detention of stormwater by developers. Uh, the Utilities Committee held a special session a few weeks ago but the most current version of the ordinance on the city's website still has key language section 74 mark for removal. I am calling to demand that the language remain in the legislation. For example, too many of my neighbors have been displaced because of city poor management stormwater. Developers out to work with communities and not become the catalyst of destruction 
and devastation that alter the fabric of what makes our community so special in the first place. We need to be partners, not adversaries, and opposing legislation that benefits our neighbors. That goes up on a path toward conflict. With the climate change and global warming, extreme storm events will be more common, making our need to capture runoff much more urgent. We're experiencing more frequent, longer lasting, and heavier rain events at the same time that we're experiencing more development, means more storm water runoff. We need legislation that recognizes this reality. By removing the requirement, this just ensures that developers need to meet the bare minimum standards as defined by the state. Removing this section leaves things at the status quo at the state level. And it doesn't account for the fact that many of our issues stem from an aging city combined sewer system, overburdening and current storms, expecting to get worse with more time, with more adverse weather due to climate change. Because of this, I'm asking you to ensure that the extended detention language that has been marked with deletion from Section 74 of the post development stormwater order remains with no change. Again, my name is David Holder. I am a resident, a long term resident of the Mechanicsville community, and I am a voter. Thank you. My name is Jacqueline Echoes, board president, and I am a South River Watershed Alliance. You, as I am, should be infuriated by the ploy being used by developers to once again have things their way by pitting the needs of one community against that of another. Their game is self-serving, hypocritical, and has been played over and over again in Atlanta with amazing success, which is in large part why this strategy is used today. It is time, no, it is way past the time for the city's leadership, mayor and council alike, to say no. Enough is enough. Addressing stormwater that a developer creates by stripping away trees, lot line to lot line, on a building site that he or she owns is the responsibility of the developer. Developers strip trees of, strip sites of trees because it saves them money. Then they turn around and argue that the cost of addressing the stormwater that they have purposefully created should not fall to them, but passed on to citizens. It is hard to believe that the mayor and council is even considering such disingenuous and self-serving rhetoric. Yet, here we are. I ask that you take your cue from the events of this past week and weekend and reject selfish egocentric politics. Stand with Atlanta citizens not against them. Support strong community protections against stormwater runoff, flooding, and pollution. Support the proposed language as written in the original version of the post-development stormwater ordinance. Thank you. Hello, good evening. This is Nick McKinney and Yolanda McKinney. We're here to talk about the runoff in the city. Oh, my wife said she's already done it. But um, at any rate, I'm here to talk about the runoff in the city, and I wanted to address um, that, you know, the runoff and what we need to be done in the city. We want to make sure that there is no blockage in our sewers or low leaves or trash, which we see a lot of when it's raining. So I would like the city council to, you know, take note of that. And uh, thank you. Hello, my name is Jason Dozier, and I live in the Mechanicsville community. And I also am the co-chair for the Nutrition Creek Community Stewardship Council, and I'm a voter. And I'm calling because I'm concerned that the city will remove key language from the post development stormwater ordinance that right now incentivizes green infrastructure and requires the extended detention of stormwater by developers. And the utilities committee held a special working session a few weeks ago, uh, but the most current version of the ordinance on the city's website still has uh, key language in section 74 mark for removal and i'm calling to demand that that language remain in the legislation uh, too many of my neighbors have been displaced because of the city's poor management of stormwater and i've personally seen how families have lost everything because of the amount of damage and disruption caused their lives the Atlanta city council is responsible for protecting the public health and environmental health of atlanta citizens and failure to support this legislation is a failure to support atlanta in my opinion and while climate change and global warming uh, uh extreme storm events uh, you know they're all more common 
and they all are making our need to capture runoff much more urgent. And we are experiencing more frequent, longer lasting, and heavier rain events at the same time uh, that we are experiencing more development, which means more stormwater runoff. And so we need legislation that recognizes this reality. Developers ought to work with our communities, and that becomes the catalyst of destruction and devastation that alter the fabric of what makes our community so special in the first place. I recognize that the Council of Quality Growth and other members of the development community have reached out to you to tell you why this is a bad idea. They are wrong. Here's why. Uh, first, while upfront construction costs are higher, aggressive retention centers can result in savings through reduced operating maintenance costs. Two, retaining stormwater incorporating other green infrastructure practices saves money because they can reduce or eliminate the need for other required water infrastructure. And three, not implementing these changes can increase insurance premiums, which disproportionately impacts vulnerable renters and homeowners. And four, it displays the expenses too. And so you may have heard messages like this earlier, and there's a reason for that. Our neighbors, our residents, our business owners, members of the clergy, we all feel that the city should be aggressive in addressing flooding. And because of this, I'm asking you to ensure that the extended detention language that has been marked for deletion from Section 74 of the ordinance remains with no changes. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for your consideration. My name is Lee Clemens, and I live in Mechanicsville, and I'm a voter. I'm calling because I'm concerned that the city will remove key language from the post-development stormwater ordinance that currently incentivizes green infrastructure and requires the extended detention of stormwater by developers. The Utilities Committee had a special working session a few weeks ago, but the most current version of the ordinance on the city's website still has key language in Section 74, March for Removal, I'm calling to demand that this language remain in the legislation. Too many of my neighbors have been displaced because of the city's poor management of stormwater. Because of this, I'm asking you to ensure the extended detention language that has been marked for deletion from Section 74 of the Post-Development Stormwater Ordinance remains with no changes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Makisha Roby, and I live in the Pittsburgh community, and I am a voter. And I'm calling because I'm concerned that the city will be removing key language from the post-development stormwater ordinance that currently incentivizes green infrastructure that requires the extended detention of stormwater by developers. The Utilities Committee had a special working session a few weeks ago, but the most current version of the ordinance on the city website still has key language in Section 74 marked for removal. I am calling to demand that that language remain in the legislation. My house in the Pittsburgh neighborhood floods during big storms, and I don't want to lose my home. My my property floods. Um, developers ought to work with communities and not become a catalyst for destruction and devastation that alter the fabric of what makes our community so special in the first place. We need to be partners and not adversary. And opposing legislation that benefits our neighbors sets us on a path toward conflict. conflict. This unchecked development creates long-term structural loss and liabilities for the city, which means we risk losing the residents, institutions, culture, and talent that make the city what it is due to the effects of displacement. Atlanta's existing ordinance has led us to become a leader in the state for how we've addressed localized flooding and water quality concerns for storm water runoff as a world-class city, and we must lead nationally as well. So because of all of this, I am asking you to ensure that the extended detention language that has been marked for deletion from Section 74 of the Post Development Stormwater Ordinance remain with no changes. Thank you so much. Tony, Woody, we understand that the department desires to incorporate additional regulations that exceed the requirements of the Metropolitan North Water Planning District in MS4 requirements. However, there needs to be a further review of how those proposed regulations will impact the cost to all residential development, particularly if the standards would be more make, would, be, would make it financially infeasible to build affordable housing development. With that said, we respectfully request at this time the Department of Watershed only make the necessary revisions to the post-development stormwater ordinance required to adhere to the Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District model ordinance due by the end of 2020 in order to meet the requirements for the city's MS4 permit and table, to, to table two, any additional changes for now, pending additional stakeholder involvement and delivery of impact data. Thank you for listening to us. <laughs> 
Hi, my name is Tom Butler. I live in Somerville, uh, in Northwater, and I'm calling in regards to the um, Post Development Stormwater Ordinance that um, currently incentivizes uh, green infrastructure and it requires the extended definition of stormwater for new development. Uh, as someone who lives in Summer Hill, I'm more than aware of the flooding that occurred with um, very heavy rain, and this new development uh, will only exacerbate that flooding if these, uh, this language is not kept in the ordinance. And I strongly urge you to keep the language as it is in the original version. Uh, again, my name is Tom Butler, I live in Summer Hill. Uh, thank you. Cody, Woody. We respectfully request at this time that the Department of Watershed only make the necessary revisions to the post development stormwater ordinance required to adhere to the Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning Department <coughs> District's uh, modal. Hold on. Thank you for your counseling and staff, and special greetings to you, citizens of Atlanta who tune in to note what your elected officials are doing. Then how... Georgia Stormwater Management Manual, so they're not 
their effectiveness is not known. Um, I recognize that uh, additional extended detention requirements are not going to be required at this point, but I hope the ordinance can be amended in order to include a task force that would look at the effectiveness of underground infiltration and other underground stormwater management strategies to determine whether these really are protecting downstream and upstream property owners as we think that they are and look at whether expanding the extended detention requirements would help better protect existing structures. I think, um, you know, we know we're going to redevelop and develop more, but we need to do so in a way that doesn't damage the existing property owners that surround new development projects. So, again, I applaud the ordinance move and would like to suggest that the ordinance be revised in order to, or amended in order to create a you know, multidisciplinary committee that would evaluate the underground infiltration and um, specifically the extended re detention requirements and whether those are appropriate for those type structures and whether those underground detention facilities really help protect the environment. Thank you for your consideration. Hi, I'm Aviva Hoffman Martin and I'm, and I'm 10 years old and I wanted to tell you how my friend's neighborhood is flooding and I want that to stop. I've been to many meetings that have learned all about how streets and basements are being flooded with sewage. I would like to ask you to make changes to the city stormwater ordinance to fix the problem for all the people that are having this. Thank you so much for making this happen. Hello, my name is Jenny Rosner and I work for American Rivers and have been working in the Entrenchment Creek community since 2013. I'm with the Entrenchment Creek One Water Management Task Force, and we are a task force made up of local community leaders, nonprofits, public, and private developers in the Entrenchment Creek headwaters in the neighborhoods of Summerhill, Peoplestown, Pittsburgh, and Mechanicsville. We have been working together for nearly three years to develop a plan for finally addressing the flooding and combined sewer spills in the headwaters at present risk to the community, risk to health, quality of life, and safety. In the plan that we've recently developed, we recommend a stormwater policy for the city that requires developers, public and private, to all incorporate extended detention in order to address the flooding and combined sewer spills. I'm calling to ask that the city council add back the deleted language on extended detention. This language was included to address the type of flooding that we have in Entrenchment Creek, and it will also benefit many other communities that are flooding and anticipate flooding more often with climate change and more frequent and intense storms. The moment is now. If we do not have an ordinance that requires extended detention, we will miss the opportunity to finally address the flooding as part of the redevelopment around the former Olympic Stadium. This would be truly an environmental and climate injustice. I appreciate your consideration and hope you'll see fit to add back the language on extended detention and finally address the flooding and combined sewer spills in the entrenchment creek headwaters and other communities around the city. Thank you. Hi, this is Maya McPherson, and I live in Mechanics for Green Birds, and I am a voter. I'm calling because I'm concerned that the city will remove key language from the post development of stormwater ordinance. It currently incentivizes green infrastructure and requires the extended extension of stormwater for developers. Um, I was in a special working session a few weeks ago. The version of the city website, city website still has key language in section 7 or marks for removal. I'm calling to demand that that language remains in the legislation. The street that I live on currently is dealing with a stormwater runoff issue. There is a giant sinkhole, and further down the street, there is a obvious leakage. Um, city, Atlanta City Council is responsible for protecting public health and environmental health of Atlanta citizens and failure to support the legislation is failure to support Atlanta's people of Atlanta. Because of this, I'm asking you to ensure that the extended detention language that has been marked for deletion from Section 74 of the Post Development Store Water Ordinance remains with no changes. Thank you. All right. 
My name is Samantha Terry, and I live in Mechanicsville, and I am a voter. And I am calling because I am concerned that the city will remove key language from the post-development stormwater ordinance that currently incentivizes green infrastructure and requires the extended detention of stormwater by developers. The Utilities Committee held a special working session a few weeks ago, but the most current version of the ordinance on the city's website still has key language in Section 74 marked for removal. I'm calling to demand that the language remain in the legislation. I was driving home during a storm and I was trapped in the downtown connector because the drains were backed up and the highways were flooded. I don't want that to happen again to either myself or a loved one. Developers ought to work with communities and not become the catalyst of destruction and devastation that alter the fabric of what makes our community so special in the first place. We need to be partners, not adversaries, and opposing legislation that benefits our neighbors sets us on the path toward conflict. Keeping the requirement will be a huge boon in helping to address water pressure issues caused by shorter, high-intensity storms. This requirement would also help address back-to-back -back storm events, which can cause flooding for multiple days. Because of this, I'm asking you to ensure that the extended detention language that has been marked for deletion from Section 74 of the Post-Development Stormwater Ordinance remains with no changes. Yes, my name is Rick Grimes, and I'm calling with a comment uh, concerning uh, the flooding that we've experienced in Mechanicsville and uh, making sure that developers are doing everything they can to safeguard our community from excess flooding. Uh, I would like that to be addressed in the meeting. Thank you so much. Uh, Mechanicsville, again, Rick Ryan. Thank you. Have a great day. My name is Yolanda McKinney, and I live in the Mechanicsville neighborhood, and I am a voter. And I am calling because I am concerned that the city will remove key language from the post development storm water ordinance that currently incentivizes green infrastructure and requires the extended detention of stone water by developers. The utility committee held a special working session a few weeks ago, but the most current version of the ordinance of the city's website still has key language in section 74 marked for removal. I am calling to demand that language remain in legislation. I was driving home during a storm and I was trapped on the downtown connector because the drains were backed up and the highways were flooded. I don't want that happening again to either me or a loved one. Atlanta's existing ordinance has led us to become a leader in the state for how we address localized flooding and water quality concerns from stormwater runoff. As a world-class city, we must lead nationally as well. Because of this, I am asking you to ensure that the extended detention language that has been marked for deletion from Section 74 of the Post Development Stormwater Ordinance remain with no changes. Thank you. My name is Alfred Tucker. I live in the Hunter Hill neighborhood. I'm in full support of keeping the language in Section 74 of the Post-Development Stormwater Ordinance that requires extended detention of stormwater created on new construction projects. The year 2020 has seen a marked increase in tropical storms affecting not only the Gulf Coast, but states of Florida north of New England. And this trend is certain to continue as a result of climate change. Our current storm events in Atlanta can overwhelm our aging sewer system. Consider the toll on public health that increased storm activity will have if post-development stormwater runoff is not stringently addressed. More flood events and water quality deterioration will surely follow. Developers can help make a difference by using green infrastructure in their projects. I am asking you to restore the language in Section 74 that provides the incentive for developers to do this. 
Hi, my name is Jerry Dyer, and I'm calling in regards to proposed new stormwater work. I've worked on stormwater and clean infrastructure issues in Atlanta for five years alongside the Department of Watershed Management. First as an employee with American Rivers, and now as a volunteer with the Entrenchment Creek Community Stewardship Council. I'm calling to reiterate the importance of reinstating the extended detention requirement that was recently redlined in Section 74 of the proposed ordinance. At first, we were thrilled with a new stormwater ordinance that would have had the ability to write significant environmental injustices across Atlanta and build a more beautiful and sustainable city for all residents. However, the last minute changes that were proposed on Monday, October 5th, make this new ordinance a weak and ineffective law. Specifically, I'm referring to the changes to the extended detention requirements that were removed from Section 74-513. Without this mechanism for enforcement, the new ordinance would have little to no effect on how Atlanta grows into the future. But today we stand at yet another crossroads. Will developers be held accountable for the externalities of their profiteering? Will Atlanta confront its racist history and pass a law that supports the disenfranchise? shouldn't be a difficult decision because in this case, the option that supports the disenfranchise is also the option that's best for the city. Please add the extended detention requirement back into the law and you will be helping ensure a green and clean city for all. And it will keep Atlanta on the path toward becoming a world-class city. Please do not hesitate to reach out with any questions. I can be reached anytime at 828-989-9023. Thank you, Jeremy. My name is Sarah Ledford, and I live in People's Town, and I am a voter. I'm calling because I am concerned the city will remove key language from the post-development stormwater ordinance that currently incentivizes green infrastructure and requires the extended detention of stormwater by developers. The Utilities Commission held a special working session a few weeks ago, but the most current version of the ordinance on the city's website still has key language in Section 74 marked for removal. I'm calling to demand that the language remain in this legislation. Living in the People's Town neighborhood, all I have to do is drive around after a storm to see how many of my neighbor's houses have been flooded due to the city's poor management of stormwater. By removing the stormwater extended detention requirement, this just ensures the developers need to meet the bare minimum standards as defined by the state. Removing this section leaves things at the status quo at the state level not taking into account the fact that many of our issues in Atlanta stem from an aging city combined to with the overburdened in current storms and expected to get worse with more best first weather due to climate change and as extended and unregulated development continues in the city, adding more sewage to an already overtaxed system. Because of this, I am asking you to ensure that the extended detention language that has been marked for deletion of Section 74 of the Post-Development Stormwater Ordinance remains with no changes. Thank you. Hello, this is Charlene Johnson, President of Historic Hunter Hills Neighborhood Association. I'd like to urge support of the stormwater changes. I think it will help to reduce or eliminate some of the flooding that happens in this community, and therefore, lots of action to take. Uh, so again, I, I raise my support on behalf of my community. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ben Emanuel. I'm a resident of the city of Atlanta, reside at 72 Warren Street Southeast in Atlanta. I'm also Director of Clean Water Supply for American Rivers. We're a national conservation organization here in our Atlanta office. I'm calling about the revisions to the proposed, uh, excuse me, I'm calling about the proposed revisions to the post-construction stormwater ordinance. I'm very disappointed that the revisions show a deletion of the proposed language on extended detention in Section 74. The language that had been drafted earlier this year on extended detention in Section 74 of the proposed revisions would provide a very important backstop to ensure that developers, public and private throughout the city, pursue green infrastructure to the extent possible, even in heavily developed areas. It's very important to note that as originally written, the ordinance updates would provide the option for rainwater, rainwater harvesting and reuse as green infrastructure practices to manage stormwater volumes. There is almost no reason why developers can't use those practices, even in heavily developed areas, to manage stormwater uh, in concert with green infrastructure practices as described in the ordinance. 
it is critically important that city council restore the language in section 74 requiring extended detention uh, for development that cannot use green infrastructure to meet the runoff reduction requirements. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, Archie Baum, a distinguished council member. My name is Kimberly Steele, the Senior Policy Analyst of the Council for Quality Growth. The Council for Quality Growth is a nonprofit trade association representing a growth and development industry with the Metro Atlanta region. The Council has appreciated the opportunity to engage with Interim Commissioner Browning and city officials and members of the Utilities Committee on the proposed revisions to the Post Development Stormwater Management Ordinance. We respectfully request that at this time, the city only make the necessary revisions to the post-development stormwater ordinance required to adhere to Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District's model ordinance and to meet the requirements for the city's NS4 permit. We recommend tabling any additional regulations for now to allow for further review and additional stakeholder involvement. Now, the our organization recognizes the risk of grappling with long-term flooding issues that continue to impact the quality of life of thousands of residents within the city of Atlanta due to aging infrastructure and increased economic development. We want to ensure the city adopts a updated ordinance that oh. 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 those needs of the city while um, and improving the quality of life for, for the entire city. Now, with the adoption of the revised post development stormwater ordinance, the city should adopt a reasonable vesting schedule for residential and commercial developers who have already invested in the city but have not accounted for the financial burden of new regulatory changes oh. for a new or redevelopment project in the city. We suggest so that any project all this stuff today. Oh, God. That's the committee. But then the
and will plan to provide updates for the remaining that are shaded in gray at the next scheduled update. And I would also appreciate your feedback regarding setting 2021 goals. 5 4, highlight the department's progress by the numbers relating our core services and functions for a reporting period. Meanwhile, slide five, uh, this information was highlighted during the last quarterly update and details DWM's modified operational strategy. Um, again, DWM identified mission essential functions in March of this year for the utility, utility and developed a continuity of operations plan for each office. Again, the key objective was to maintain continuity of operations to meet current requirements, address the emergency maintenance issues during the during in the event of a shortage of essential staff due to impacts of the pandemic. Uh, thankfully, the department were continuing to not experience any shortages in essential staff and have been able to maintain a sufficient operational posture to deliver essential services. Currently, we have roughly between 500 to 550 employees that are teleworking and about 993 that have been deemed mission critical and are reporting on a daily basis. Um, similarly, I'd like to note that we've resumed meetings for the technical panel for repair and buffer virtually that uh, resumed on October 21st. And a panel is currently meeting on a biweekly basis to catch up on workload. Uh, meanwhile, the Water Sewer Appeals Board is scheduled to resume meetings virtually next month. Slide six uh, details CWM pandemic response. Uh, Today, DWM has, has experienced 53 positive cases. Um, a continuing top priority is to ensure that our workforce has the proper measures to perform essential functions in a safe and protective manner. Uh, we've conducted over 68,000 non-invasive temperature screenings at 14 locations. We offered on-site testing for essential employees during the months of August, September, and October. And to date, DWM has expended roughly $1.6 million for the purchase of COVID-related PPEs. We're continuing to, to conduct daily touch point cleanings and scheduled deep cleanings at all DWM facilities. Cleans are conducted within a 24-hour period upon notification of a positive or suspected case. Site 7, we've experienced two significant wet weather events as a result of major hurricanes during the reporting period. The first was Hurricane Sally, which resulted in 3.6 inches of rainfall within a 24-hour period that resulted in localized flooding and, and inundated the combined system. The second was Hurricane Delta, which resulted in 4.53 inches of rainfall within a 24-hour period with similar conditions. In response to both storm events, CWM completed prompt post-storm inspection and cleanup for affected areas, and we are reviewing further possible peak flow limit exceedances by DeKalb County relative to the Peachtree Creek Basin. The next two slides, uh, as a result of the boil water advisory that occurred early summer, DWM has taken proactive steps to implement enhancements to our emergency no notification process to ensure that we are promptly notifying all necessary officials and impacted citizens in a more timely manner. In the event of an emergency, we will be sending an initial notice within the first 30 minutes of an incident which will be followed by a map of the impacted area within one hour of the incident, followed by major updates every four hours at most. Similarly, we will be utilizing a multitude of communications platforms, including text messaging, email alerts, robocalls, postings on DWM city and social media websites, in addition to press releases. We have developed a comprehensive distribution list for ATL 311 and are coordinating with them for emergency on-call phone coverage during after hours and weekends as needed. We can advance to slide number 11. This provides an update regarding our personnel status. For the reporting period, we had 1,646 active authorized positions, uh, 1417 are filled and 194 vacancies. Recall that for FR21 budget cleanup resulted in 132 vacancy positions being abolished, as well as temporary pause on hiring, which ended in June 2020. Since then, we've implemented a routine headcount management effort to better closely manage our hiring approvals and vacancies. The current focus is mission critical positions, which will help minimize extra help creations and FOC creations. 
23 of 47 um, of the ones that are currently in process or external hires, we're seeing positive interest in external candidates. which helps to reduce the true vacancies. Meanwhile, we've processed 14, I'm sorry, 15 hires, promotions, transfers within a reported period, which is also positive and reflects internal opportunities for growth and advancement within DWM. We are continuing efforts to recruit talent for mission critical positions via virtual career fairs and related recruitment events, external job postings, et cetera. We can advance the slide 13, 12 through 13. These provide a snapshot of our FY21 financials for the period. We're continuing to operate within our target budget. Operationally, we've had we have we have expended roughly 27% of our allocated budget for personnel and 18% of the allocated budget for non-personnel expenditures. As of September, our actual revenues were roughly 3.7% higher than the projected, and expenses were within budget. We can advance to slide 14. This provides an update regarding DWM state and federal financing for DWM projects. Uh, the refinancing of the Series 20 bonds will result in 3.8 million annual debt service savings. DWM, DWM successfully entered into a WIFIA master loan agreement to fund various water and wastewater projects. Uh, we are the first utility to enter into a master loan agreement, which provided, which provides the flexibility to add and remove projects as needed and draw down on the authorized amount. The total eligible project approved project cost is 419 million. Um, DWM has made a commitment to 115 million of that, while WIFIA will um, supplement the remaining 49 percent, which amounts to 205 million. A few notable projects that will be funded under the WIFI agreement include the Northport Storage Tank and Pump Station, our sewer group for small dam rehab, which are both pursuant to our consent decrees, as well as several other sewer group five and six consent decree projects. Additionally, it will help fund the downtown water storage tank project and the Hemp Hill Steam Pump Station project and other linear and vertical capital improvements projects. We we'll also were approved for GIFA payment deferral interest-free period, which equates to roughly 2.5 million in savings under fiscal year 21. You can advance to slide 15. This provides an update regarding DWM's Care and Conserve program. In light of COVID-19, the program has expanded its services and funding. Two million has been allocated to assist qualifying customers with plumbing repairs and bill payment assistance. The program has also made it easier for customers to apply for assistance through a new online application, as well as supporting documentation submittal via text. And the program is fostering public outreach by hosting seminars with other social service providers to educate the public on the program. If you can advance to slide 17. Slide 17 and 18 really provide an update on DWM CSAT metrics. Um, overall, on-time SLA for DWM for the month of September was 94.5%. Office of Watership Protection SLA for September was 87.1%. Uh, a little bit of a slippage due to changes in business due to the pandemic um, really impacted the office's ability to meet the SLA. Meanwhile, OCCBS, uh, the SLA for September was 100%, and OLEO's SLA for September was 88.6%. Advancing to slide 19 provides an update on our on only a service request. 52% uh, of service requests were relating sewer collections division with 88% resolved. Meanwhile, 48% of service requests were relating water distribution division, division with 86% resolved. Advancing to slide 21 through 22 like to provide a highlight on a few departmental initiatives. 521 in January, DWM initiated, initiated the Integrated Biosolids Zero Waste Project. Due to increasing cost of biosolids and limited landfill availability in Georgia, DWM engaged other metro utilities to formulate a regional committee to discuss and evaluate whether a regional facility could be a viable and sustainable solution. Fellow utility members that participated include Cobb, Gwinnett, Fulton, DeKalb, and Clayton. 
several workshops later, it appears that we've garnered positive results and support among stakeholders and have developed a roadmap. Results indicate that a co-processing co that co-processing of wastewater residuals with other waste streams could be an environmental and economical solution. We explored viable technologies to employ. The resulting benefits include reduced landfill use and expenditures, beneficial reuse for waste, and create energy in the process. And the next slide, which is 22, illustrates the concept layout for regional organic the energy center utilizing the Utoy Creek WRC as a hub. I scheduled to reconvene with the committee on next week to discuss the topic of governance and next steps to advance the efforts. Slide 23 through 24, um, we assembled a technical team to advance uh, remaining fast release and flood mitigation projects relating to Custer Avenue subbasin of Intentional Creek. The area has seen extreme and more frequent rain events. Capacity relief projects are proposed to address system limitations. We do have short to mid to long term measures proposed to aid in addressing flooding. A few tasks have been completed, such as cleaning of debris within the entrenchment creek to remove restrictions, as well as ongoing measures, such as routine catch basin cleanings and active monitoring of the Custer Avenue CSO channel utilizing a camera. Mid to long term measures, such as storage vaults or pending completion to further enhance system capacity and temporarily store excess volumes of surface runoff during peak wet weather events and alleviate flood occurrences. Advancing to slide 25. As you know, in 2019, DWM launched the Adopt the Drain program. The program seeks to improve the city's storm drain system by educating and promoting the public's involvement in stormwater management and maintenance. Volunteers commit to maintain storm inlet structures within their communities. And to date, the program has amassed about 69 volunteers with 151 storm inlet structures adopted. Advancing to slide 27, I'm going to provide an update on compliance related items. Uh, slide 27 provides an update relating to our NPDES com compliance. Uh, during the reporting period, we experienced four violations for the reporting, four violations. Uh, three violations sustained at the South River WRC for dissolved oxygen non-compliance as a result of power surges that resulted in damages to the control system. Repairs to the control system are in progress. Meanwhile, one violation sustained at the East Area WQCF was for failure to collect a graph sample. Um, to mitigate that, a new SOP was instituted and coupled with coaching and additional employee training for reinforcement. Advancing to slide 28, this summarizes our sanitary sewer spills for the reporting period. We had a total of 51 spills reported. We recorded six major spills for the period and attributed to the significant wet weather events. And most were focused along the Peachtree Creek and Nancy Creek trunk systems. A project is pending construction that will address rain induced spills for the 2335 Adams Drive location. The project is scheduled to commence early quarter one, 2021. Meanwhile, operational adjustments at the uh, Arm Clayton WRC and associated remote facilities were instituted to address future peak flow conditions. And lastly, slides 30 through 37 provide updates regarding uh, various active CIP projects. A few notable include our most, fun, most funded stormwater project. We have our Northport storage tank and pump station capacity project that is currently in design phase, as well as our water supply program. And there's other projects that are highlighted that you can uh, look to review at your leisure. Uh, subject to your questions, this concludes the quarterly update. I sincerely thank you for your time and attention this morning, as always. Thank you, Commissioner, for giving us this um, presentation and for your sensitivity to our time constraints. Uh, this is a lot of information. Let me see if uh, any colleagues have questions. Uh, I can't see. Um, Mr. Evans, do we have any? Council Member Hillis would like to speak. Thank you. Mr. Hillis, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Madam Commissioner Browning. 
um, since I have an already agenda, I'll keep it uh, quick and to the point uh, and just uh, bring up one issue that has continually been an issue, and that is uh, getting hydrant leaks and uh, issues repaired in an uh, acceptable amount of time, and that's kind of shown by the uh, CSTAT metrics that are presented, and those continue to be a problem. And I know we've historically went to outside contractors to address those, so why are we still seeing compliances in the 20 to 50 percent percent uh, range and what's the what's the end game for those so team hill is that yes i've noticed some slippages on our earlier slide with regard to the hydrant um, issues and i'll be working with our team to really address um, meeting slas getting back on target to meet slas for um, not just hydrant leaks, but meter leaks as well. I've gotten quite a bit of feedback from the community about the length of time that it takes to, you know, takes for a response for those. So um, I would say I'm going to be very proactive in working with our, our office lending infrastructure to address the timeliness of addressing those types of issues going forward. And we'll look to see some improvements going into the next reporting period. All right. I look forward to that, and uh, thank you for your feedback. All right, colleagues, anyone else? All right, Commissioner, uh, thank you very much for uh, that presentation. And our next uh, quarterly update is from the Department of Public Works. Uh, is that going to be presented by uh, Mr. Johnson, Deputy Chief, Deputy CRO Johnson? Yes. Yes, ma'am. And good, uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. And as Commissioner Browning just mentioned, we'll certainly be respectful of you all's time uh, this morning and, and as we go through the presentation. So this quarterly uh, report will certainly give a highlight on some of the major activities and actions within the Department of Public Works. And we do have several key uh, team members available to kind of speak to some of the specifics of, the, of their respective areas of operation within the department. And so the, the uh, slide number two, I'll certainly give Rita Braswell an opportunity to kind of speak through the financials and we'll continue through the presentation. Uh, Rita. All right, well, it sounds like uh, Rita may be on mute, but I'll go ahead and uh, continue forward. Um, as you can see, uh, with respect to the departmental financial snapshot, we are trending um, and tracking within 20% or utilizing 20% of our um, budget allocations over the course of this particular quarter. And the department has been very cognizant with respect to ensuring that we are staying within budget uh, given uh, fiscal picture and outlook going forward. And so one of the main drivers that has allowed us to stay within budget is the reality that we have not uh, been in a position to fill all of our uh, vacant positions. And so that has helped uh, significantly uh, in this particular area. Uh, with respect to um, FY21, uh, the Q1 COVID pandemic response expenses, um, on the bottom section, you'll see the Office of Solid Waste Services. On the contract uh, labor line item, you can see that we've expended about $82,000 uh, um, on labor as well as supplies. And the same for Office and Fleet Services. Uh, you'll certainly see um, what we did. expended approximately six, just over $61,000 um, in labor, as well as just over $4,000 uh, for, uh, for uh, supplies. And I did get a note that, Rita, are you on the line? Would you like to go ahead and speak to um, Mr. Pilates? I am. I was unmuted, and you stated it perfectly. Okay, sounds good. All right, sounds good. Well, we'll go ahead and move forward to the uh, next slide, number three. As you can see, um, this is pretty much giving a, a specific breakdown on how and where those expenditures have been uh, utilized. And um, and as you, you may be able to make the correlation that you, you see that the expenses are broken down by many of the, the calls that we tend to get when there is a, a um, someone that has, that has tested positive for COVID. And so we've outlined here where those specific locations are and the costs associated uh, with those particular items. 
One of the key um, individuals on our team, Kelly Glockenberg, she's been very instrumental in ensuring that, one, we're following all the respective protocols from the emergency preparedness and management standpoint, but also she's really leaned very heavily in on identifying ways in which we can utilize and identify cost saving and proactive measures. And I'll give her an opportunity to kind of speak specifically to those items. Kelly, are you on the line if you're ready? Thank you, DCO Johnson. To cut down on our COVID-related expenses and prepare for their approaching cold and flu season, DPW has increased our internal capacity for enhanced cleaning and disinfecting procedures with the purchase of commercial-grade equipment and disinfectant. We conducted two, two training sessions and two live demonstrations with 38 personnel participating, where we trained our personnel on proper use of the equipment our enhanced cleaning and disinfecting procedures and PPE usage. Currently, the enhanced cleaning procedures have already been implemented by our, at our fleet service locations. They occur on a weekly rotation for eight fleet shops and facilities. Solid waste services will begin implementation when their equipment arrives. Next slide, please. To highlight our, a few aspects of our continued COVID-19 safety practices, in addition to the weekly enhanced cleaning and disinfecting, we've implemented a no mask, no service policy at our fleet and yard debris processing facilities that provide services to other departments and visitors. We've increased the signage at those locations as well, just as a reminder of the mask guidelines. We continue to conduct our daily health screenings which include temperature checks at our facilities. And we continue to update our processes while we monitor the latest data and public health guidance and, and modify our approach accordingly. Thank you, council members. Thank you, and next slide, please. So uh, one of the key uh, initiatives that you all, I'm, I'm sure, have have heard a lot, a lot about and have utilized um, staff resources is, is Operation Clean Feet. And this is on, falls under the Fix It Atlanta uh, umbrella. And as the, some of the you know, marketing material and just communication that you have seen, this is truly um, the administration's approach to trying to get a, a, a much better handle on what we've seen over the course of COVID to address cleanliness and beautification in and throughout the city. And we heard you all loud and clear with respect to, I, I believe, Councilmember Winslow said, said to us, you know, you, you can't use COVID as an excuse anymore. We've got to do better. And I think one of the things that we've been able to, to, to do with respect to Operation Clean Sweep is lean very heavily on the resources, the internal resources that we have as, as a city. And, and one thing that we may not have done as well as is just previously is really asking for help. And so we're very appreciative appreciative of some of our brother sister departments, Parks and Recreation, ATL DLT, um, our code enforcement initiative, and as you heard on yesterday from uh, Major Schierbauer Sh on the, the, the way in which the, the code enforcement division has really helped with respect to Operation uh, Clean Sweep. Um, on the right side of the slide, you'll see a, a weekly dashboard, and it really just highlights, and this, this is our internal sort of tracking mechanism that we use to sort of track what this campaign has done, what have we accomplished over the course, over the course of, of, of this period of time. And over the course of the campaign, as you see, the, the last column that says campaign total, when we started this initiative, the SR represents the number of service requests. So as you can see, we've had 729 service requests, and just below that equates to that 670 um, tons of, deb of debris that has been collected. With respect to delittering and cutting, as you can see, we've cut just over 45 miles of, of right-of-way and delittered that amount of right-of-way over the course of this period of time. Um, and on the bulk collection side, as you all can see, we've collected just over uh, nearly 2,500 tons of debris on the bulk collection side, and finally, on the illegal sign removals. Those are areas that we've certainly highlighted through this initiative, and I've been very appreciative to have conversations with many of you as it relates to um, Operation Clean Sweep and trying to get a uh, much better handle on this effort. 
Um, on the left side of the slide down below, where it says solid waste personnel recovery plan, one of the things that we've been trying to, to do a better job at is, is really just infusing uh, our, our, our departments with talent and individuals that can really help boost up our operations. And one of the challenges that we had in just getting behind is really just boils down to having enough staff resources. And so one of the things that uh, we've done very well, which is working very closely with the mayor's office of immigrant affairs to look at the ways in which we can do um, and have more diversity initiatives um, as well as continuing the hiring blitz campaigns and some of you may have seen on your various social media outlets specifically on uh, twitter as well as linkedin where we did have uh, some bi bilingual um, communication material to just say hey look the city of atlanta we're open we're ready we, we want you to come and apply we do believe that we are moving closer to becoming an employer of choice uh, next slide please um here you will just see uh, some of the before and after pictures of what uh, we've been able to accomplish during this time and this work is just a combination of not just the department of public works but some of the other departments that have leaned in and helped us uh, during this time uh, next slide please and so on slide number seven uh, what you'll see are some of the performance metrics that you all uh, kind of see on a regular basis and and how we're tracking uh, with respect to the service, um, in the, the upper left quadrant, that first quadrant, that solid waste service tonnage, you'll see where we've been trending with respect to the garbage recycling and trends and the and yard trends, excuse me, the number of tonnages that we've been able to accumulate over this period of time, which has remained relatively uh, consistent uh, to a degree. On the uh, upper right-hand quadrant at the top, we were showing some of the missed collections. Um, obviously, there are areas in which we can improve and we need to improve, and we're working hard to do that with the infusion of employees uh, coming into the organization, which will help significantly. Uh, down below, the one area that we still have struggled with a little bit here, um, here recently on the yard trimming side, um, while we've been able to go back um, and, and pick up um, areas that we may have missed on the scheduled day, uh, one of the things that did hurt us a bit over the last two weeks, um, our crews have been assisting with some of the of the um, tree removal work that's been performed all across the city and having upwards of you know, 500 or so, nearly 500 trees that have fallen in throughout the city. That's something that we certainly recognize we were going to see a dip on, but going forward, we anticipate being able to get a much better handle on them. But going back to, you know, from July to October, we have seen marked improvement. We're certainly working hard to improve in those areas. And the, the last two areas with respect to safety events and bin delivery, continuing down the path of, of trying to make sure we're doing everything that we can do to ensure the highest level of service that we're meeting at least meeting expectations but we certainly strive to um, exceed um, in all these categories uh, next slide please um, the next slide which will uh, I'll allow Kitty Greenley to speak to this particular uh, slide uh, uh, some of the community engagement um, opportunities and actions that we've seen and, and during uh, the most recent town hall um, that we had you know Kanika did have an opportunity to, to speak to some of these items but I will allow her the opportunity to speak specifically to some of the community engagement um, activities um, that have occurred over this quarter. Kanika I'll turn it over to you. Thank you uh, ECO Johnson. Uh, good morning uh, members of the committee. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, in June, we resumed our community cleanup event. Um, we have some COVID-19 guidelines that we share with our volunteers. Um, we offer the masks and gloves if they are needed. And um, if you see on the chart in front of you, um, there are some of our, our totals um, for the uh, quarter one of fiscal year 21. We've had 134 events, over 600 volunteers and nearly 1,200 volunteer hours. And we've cleaned um, with volunteer help uh, nearly 118 miles and collected nearly 31,000 pounds of trash. We've been also working on some corporate partnerships um, with uh, some of our corporate uh, members in the um, Atlanta community. Uh, we uh, had an event um, with Walmart, uh, the location on MLK, where we did um, a cleanup with all of their Atlanta market stores. 
Um, and as a result of that, they want to continue engaging in the partnership. And we have a pending um, $5,000 grant from Walmart um, where we'll uh, use them to install uh, trash and litter receptacles uh, in that Vine City uh, area and community. Um, we also are continuing to work um, with a grant that was funded through Coca-Cola and is managed by the Recycling Partnership. Um, if you recall, that uh, grant was to improve recycling in the city of Atlanta. $3.1 million um, dedicated to household recycling. Uh, we did a round of Feet on the Streets, which is recycling audits. Um, and we concluded that work in January 2020. We were scheduled to go back out in March. And then due to COVID, we pulled that back. So we are now looking at opportunities and ways on how we're going to spend um, the remainder of those grant funds. We're a year and a half into a three-year commitment for that grant. Um, we've also had a, a cleanup in historic Collier Heights that uh, partnered with several council members. Uh, and then we've done several um, right away uh, receptacle installations um, in downtown and West End, and we have several pending. That's probably one of the top requests that we get is for uh, trash can installations in the city. Um, and we've done some speaking engagements um, here in Georgia and nationally. Great. Thank you so much, Kanika. And so we'll move forward to the uh, next slide. So here we uh, are, these are simply you know, data points that show some of our service levels um, that we performed over this quarter um, in our fleet services um, division. And so as you can see, um, these are just, we're continuing to get process and, and perform maintenance, preventative maintenance repairs and that sort of thing. One of the key initiatives that we certainly been looking at is the identification of ways in which we can improve the turnaround time from the time vehicles come into the facility to the time that they leave. That's been one of the, one of the areas of opportunities that we've heard about over this period of time that would really make um, our operation maybe run a little bit smoother just from an external departmental perspective when they come to bring their vehicles. But there are some things that we can certainly do better on and we can improve upon to ensure that, that we're meeting um, our, our, especially our customers, our internal customers' uh, expectations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and here, as we sort of bring this down the home stretch, um, these are just simply just highlighting some of our safety training and the number of hours that we've, uh, we've conducted over this period of time. One of the key initiatives, initiatives is really looking at how do we promote from within to ensure that employees have the opportunity to move up from whether you're a laborer, you want to move into a driver role. And we, as you can see, the CDO, the, the one area that I'm really, really proud of is that CDO employee training hours because those are truly, you know, some of our key, I guess, backbone, you know, the, the, um, employees to really help us move this is for because we recognize the competitive environment with respect to city of drivers so being able to promote from within um, is something that I'm very, very proud of. Um, next slide, please. Here we have our uh, departmental staffing uh, scorecard, and, and this just simply shows just you know, our overall metrics with respect to field vacant, allocated, and percent filled um, positions. As, as I stated, you know, we are placing much more emphasis on our, um, really our boots on the ground that are delivering the day-to-day -day services um, as it stands on right now. And so I just wanted to make sure that um, I make mention to that. I'm very proud of, of, of Jennifer Hicks, who's joined our department and is serving as our interim HR business partner. And she has absolutely hit the ground running with respect to providing the HR services that we so sort of need within the department. And here on the right side of the slide, and as I mentioned earlier, you will see um, a, a, a mock-up of what was communicated and sent out with respect to um, employees and excuse me, positions that we're currently recruiting for in the department in both English and Spanish. So this is certainly something I'm very happy uh, that we've been able to, to move forward with. Uh, we hadn't quite seen the results that we're looking for, but this is an opportunity that we will continue uh, going forward. Um, down below, um, the bottom section on the left-hand side that where it says uh, staffing initiatives, obviously, as I mentioned, in the partnership with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, 
Uh, but two areas that I really want to make mention um, that has been brought to the department, which I'm very um, excited about us exploring, is the pending partnership with technical schools um, so that we can make sure that we have that pipeline, as we've seen in, in some of our uh, private sector organizations, a pipeline of employees from coming from our technical schools being embedded into the department so that we have this sort of a robust training opportunity when positions come open and available. And we do believe that it's an opportunity for us as an organization to give back. And also, finally, enhancement of an apprenticeship program within uh, our fleet services uh, division. Next slide. The next two slides, uh, which I won't go through and read, um, you, you all have, have in front of you, are just some of the adopted program highlights um, that we were asked about, and so I just wanted to just make sure that I, that I called out that those are here on slides 12 and 13. If there are any particular questions that we can certainly answer for you um, as you review this, we'll be sure to, to do so. Uh, and finally, um, as we close out and want to be respectful of time, I just want to take a moment to not only thank our management team um, across the department, but also acknowledge the, the veterans that are in the Department of Public Works who, while they're working tomorrow, are continuing, just like everybody else, continues to, to, to serve their country and serve our community. I just want to take a moment to honor them and thank them for uh, their service. Uh, with that said, uh, Madam Chair, I'll go ahead and turn the floor over to you for any questions. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Evans, are there any uh, colleagues who have indicated by speaker button that they'd like to talk? I see Mr. Mavikai. Go ahead, Mr. Mavikai. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, just had one question, and, and that is with regard to the um, storm and the trees that, that um, fell and uh, were cleaning up, how does the Department of um, Public Works coordinate with the Parks Department? It, it's um, somewhat confusing for residents to know, you know, uh, trees that are in the right of way, not in the right of way, trees that are on private property that fall into the right of way and then get put into the right of way for bulk collection. Um, how do you sort through that and with the emergency services that the mayor authorized, are we just picking up everything or do, how does a customer sort of engage when they have these trees that have fallen with the storm um, on their property at, in or near the right of way? Sure. Um, thank you, Council Member, for that question. And so I, I may, uh, if I misspeak, I apologize, and I'll make sure to get the correct information. But generally speaking, the Department of Parks and Recreation is the lead department that handles and addresses everything with respect to a fallen tree within the public right of way. And so I just think from sidewalk to sidewalk, and that's just sort of my ballpark way in which I described it. The Department of Public Works has leaned in and really supported the effort to try to remove some of the trees because of the sheer volume to try to remove some of the trees out of the right of way where possible um, in support of the Department of Public Works as well as when um, there's an assignment whether it's a part a forestry team within um, parts or it's a private contractor and in, in, in this case we had Ashford and Ceres um, leaning into this effort to try to help us get through this work a lot quicker and the department of parks of, of uh, public works we just come back and backfill when necessary to try to get you know public rights of way open that are high volume high quarter um facilities and the same for our public safety um facilities and or health care medical facilities so that's the way in which we sort of operate and work now when we do have sort of leftover debris that's in the public right of way that's not a bulk collection our yard debris team, they've been going out and trying to collect as much as possible, but generally speaking, when those items do fall, um, are in the right of way that have been cut and, and stacked. We certainly, if there's a landscape company, we fully expect those landscape companies to take that material with them um, as per our, um, our guiding uh, uh, legislative documents or what have you. Um, however, there are instances where there are items that fall within the public right of way that, that may be left, and so the department, by way of 311 or some other avenue, whether it's a call from the council member that will kind of point those out to us, which is always very helpful, 
that's the way in which the department. So we really serve as a as a support system to the forestry department on what their respective needs are. Thank you. Uh, is that it, Mr. Mazakai? Yes. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, no problem. Uh, Councilmember Shepard. Thank you, uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you for the report. I'm going to go back to fix it ATL. So, and I appreciate the work y'all been doing in the last month or so to actually go out in these communities across all districts to clean it up. I still feel some of the things that I reported that still have not gotten done yet. So let me ask, is the fix it ATL, is this our ongoing program or is this is something just temporarily? And in terms of, so, and I know the last report we had, we talked about fleet officers and right away cutting was in quadrants of the city. And at one point they were over in the south side of my district. So now with the fix it ATL, I guess you're coming in and not only picking up bulk, but doing um, right away cuttings and all of that. So which protocol should we follow in terms of the new this process of fix it ATL? The clean well, Yes, ma'am. Thank you uh, for that question. So this will be an ongoing initiative um, because we recognize the sheer volume of work that needs to be done. And so we've not identified a, a, a date where the program is going to end. And so as we get out in, and we're in the neighborhoods and in the community, we recognize and, and see. And what's very, very helpful um, is we're, we're looking we're, we're, we're taking the approach of using our work order management system to guide the work that's being done. So when you called us and we were able to put um, information in on locations that need to be addressed, we'll mold those into our work order management system. And quite candidly, it, uh, sometimes we do have duplications and, and, and sometimes we may have missed it. And it sounds like we, you know, what you just described and what you have already, what you just described and said, hey, look, you know, I, I called this in and it hasn't been done yet. That's an opportunity for us to go back out and make sure we address that okay. immediately. And so at the end of the day, I'd love to reach out to you directly and we can just talk through those and make sure we hit those particular items as soon as possible. Okay. And the bulk pickup now, I know at one point we were behind on bulk collection. Uh, again, based on this, we're still on a bulk schedule and are we kind of up to date now in terms of trash collection, you know, one point, you know, we changed it with COVID-19. Are we still back on the COVID-19 process? Have we caught up? That's my question. Have we caught up with the book? Yes, I would definitely say we're, we're as close to being caught up as we can possibly be, and I, I would dare say we are. Um, what's helped is the fact that we have engaged the external resources uh, of series to help us get caught up, and obviously with the infusion of employees coming into the department, we can certainly backstop the work that's all already being done. So I, I would definitely say we're very close to being as caught up as, as possible. But, you know, unfortunately, when things get cleaned up, you have the unfortunate circumstances of people going back out and putting stuff out again. And so I know. You know, we are cognizant of that, and unfortunately, but we'll certainly, uh, Antoinette Golden, who's uh, on our communications team, has really looked at ways for us to really work closely with their office of communication to get some uh, public service announcements or something created. Hey, look, it's time for us to take pride in our, in our community. It's not just our, the department's response, it's everybody's responsibility. So so those are some of the ideas and initiatives that we've been looking at. And obviously, you know, taking a lead that you've been able to do on uh, the code enforcement and some of your expectations, you can certainly want to pluck some of your ideas and, and apply them here in public work. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's all, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. I don't see anyone else in the queue, so I have uh, a couple myself. Uh, first, and I wanted to um, commend Interim Commissioner Browning for following what I've recommended. I've been talking about this forever, which is when you do a quarterly update, we'd like to see an org chart. You know, uh, and so the first slide would be helpful to see who's uh, in place in leadership and. Uh, areas of responsibility. So I will reiterate that, that I would have liked to have seen that. And then secondly, the uh, responsibilities of DPW uh, have kind of piggybacking off of uh, what uh, House Member Mazakite referenced. Sometimes there's confusion around what's an ATLDOT responsibility and what's the DPW responsibility. It would be great to just have a slide that 
sort of um, clarifies that because this will be put on our website to be a reference guide for uh, citizens and so I would not miss an opportunity uh, to do that at least until we get more acclimated to the responsibilities and so those are just a couple of comments and thirdly your picture on the front is cute I wish they had on masks or they were social distance but that's just my opinion uh, as it relates to uh, and I'm not letting you talk right and that's on purpose uh, as that's it relates right. to, because I know you hear me. As it relates to street sweeping, and thank you for participating in the District 5 uh, town hall um, a week or so ago. And a follow-up question that came from that is related to street sweeping, and it's, again, something that I've been concerned about a number of uh, my colleagues have as well, and that is how can we make the street sweeping more effective? And that's around increased notice mm -hmm. to the public that sweeping is happening every day and then we need to do you know and I lived in uh, Minnesota I mean it was they would tow your car if you were in the west they made sure they get, they got the street services done in a way that the um, folks who lived there knew that there was a penalty for obstructing and so you park on one side of the street versus another side of the street given advance notice and it allowed for a more complete sweeping of the street to really happen. And so I'd like to see more in the way of uh, strategies in place to make sure that we give better, uh, longer advance notice, and that there be some incentive, if not a penalty, for uh, not removing vehicles and other obstructions from the street curb when we're in fact doing the street sweeping. If you'd like to react to that, uh, I'm open to hearing that. Yes, ma'am, and you know, that was something that was brought up uh, during the town, town hall, and, and we, we have not as a department gone back to really dig into this particular item, but what we will do is, in conjunction with other you know, key strategy initiatives and, and improvements that we're looking at, is make sure that this is a top priority, because it is something that not only you've brought up, but other council members have brought up to us that we really would like to see a more, I guess, holistic approach with respect to street sweeping. So. Um, I'll actually connect with our team and also engage with the Mayor's Office of Innovation and Performance Group because they, they, they are such a phenomenal resource and they've been extraordinarily helpful with helping us improve our operations going forward. So I'll be sure to take that under advisement. And at our, at our next meeting, the items that you mentioned, I'll be sure to include this um, as well. What do we need to do going forward with respect to street sweeping, and what are those improvements that we'll, we would have already implemented, or we, what we will be implementing in the very near future? And I would absolutely, um, not that I know what the mayor's team is doing, but watershed management is so critical to uh, this whole function as well, because where the leaves that don't get swept away and the debris that doesn't get swept away, where does it wind up, right? In our storm mm -hmm. drains, not leave DWM out of that conversation but that's just me and uh, the last thing that I had was um, I know that there's been some right-of-way clearing that's been happening and it's been done with ATL DOT is that correct yes ma'am it has okay and so once there's been the clearing or maybe cutting back of limbs and bushes and that kind of thing what's the uh, who's responsible for coming back and picking up the results of the right-of-way clearing? Is it one department or another, or is it all on you at that point? I, so I, I don't know the answer right offhand. Um, with respect, generally speaking, uh, once those rights of way are cleared uh, by the DPW team, it, it is the expectation of our folks once we, clear, we cut it, we got it piled up, we go back and pick it up. And so that is the expectation, but I, I'm sure there are some nuances that I, I, I may miss. And so with that being said, I'll, I'll be sure to get it, the appropriate answer to that question. Uh, but generally speaking, once once we cut it, with it and frankly, during during this time of, of joint partnership, if it's cut, and our ADOT, they've been very helpful on just, hey, look, if we cut it, we'll stack it, we'll go ahead and move it. And so we just want to make sure that we're aligned long-term on the approach on who does what and so but I, I do apologize I can't tell us the answer to that question at this okay. point. Okay. 
Well, that's fine, and, and I'll just uh, say Hope's Claw is a street that is instructive in that space. There's been the right-of-way uh, cutting and, and cleanup, and we don't know which department did it, but we do know that the debris is still on Hope's Claw. So um, I appreciate your looking into that, but more broadly, having that uh, sort of mapped out so that we and the constituents can understand lines of responsibility it goes back to my preliminary points around an org chart and having a descriptor of what DPW is responsible for as part of your presentation would be extremely helpful. Yes, ma'am, we will do that. All right, that's all that I have, and I see that uh, announcement there. Please, Winslow, I have a few okay. questions. All right, all right. Uh, Councilmember Hipless is already indicated. You'll be after Councilmember Hillis. Mr. Hipless. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy CEO Johnson, for the presentation, and thanks to all the DPW staff for uh, what they do for our city. Um, you know, just reiterating what what has already been stated uh, by Chairwoman Archibong, and we've had many many conversations about getting road maintenance uh, where it needs to be. Uh, just using my example that we've discussed many times, I've asked for a handful of, you know, certain streets to be to have road maintenance dating back to uh, July, uh, starting under the previous commissioner, um, and those uh, are still pending, even though there's been multiple uh, work orders placed, service request numbers, etc. Um, so um, I'm hoping that we are moving in a better space in regards to that. And then also just, uh, I think I brought this up at the last meeting, but again, expanding on what Chairwoman Archibong said, uh, as far as, you know, the cutting is one thing, but then actually getting that right away clean is another, uh, because generally what I see happening is uh, the crews come through and cut, and what was 100 pieces of trash in the right away becomes 10,100 pieces of trash <laughs> after it's over, um, and then it's just left there. Uh, so that's something we definitely need to get better at um and uh, also um <clears throat> another issue um is uh again speaking of street sleeping as Cheryl Marchabong also touched on um uh, that's something that we need to get a lot more aggressive about um there are there's just for an example there was one street in, in my neighborhood that hadn't really had, had a great street sleeping in years and there were so much so many leaves and silt and everything built up and it had stopped up all the uh, storm drains um, and thankfully DPW came out very, or excuse me, uh, watershed management uh, came out very quickly and cleaned those drains and I don't know if uh, they, they cleaned up the right away or whether uh, uh, DPW or ATL, DOT did, um, uh, but they had to you know, scrape all of the silt that had been built up over the years in that street and that, that turned around very quickly uh but there have been a few i've turned in since then and uh there seems to be you know uh, a lot of back and forth and, and finger pointing between uh dwm uh and atl dot as to who is responsible for what and really what i want to see and what the residents want to see are just clean streets and uh storm drains that aren't stopped up and uh, and flood flood the street so um Hopefully we're uh, we're headed in a uh, a direction of improvement there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Kelly. All right, thank, thank you, Ms. And uh, uh, I just to echo what uh, my colleagues said, said Council Members Archibong and Phyllis, in regard to the street. Um because a lot of what's on, you know, on the side of the road, it, it could be handled by the people if it was done more frequently. And I don't think people, and I think um, uh, uh, Deputy uh, Chief Operating Officer, I think we kind of talked about, I talked to somebody about maybe looking at a more comprehensive plan in regard to what are the things that we need to do because we're a big city now and so we've got to come up with something better and i'm in agreement you know 
Uh, I lived in New York for a while, and so, you know, they had one side of the street on Tuesday, Thursday, that they put the street, and Thursday, Saturday, it was another side of the street. So we've got to come up with something, because that's going to help with some flood in the street that's that taking place. Because they're cor- we've got so much debris going down into our tax basin system, okay, and it's clogging it up at some point in time. And um, so that's something that you just got to look at. That's just long term. I mean, maybe it'll take a year to do a big study and looking at other cities, what needs to be done. At one time, we tried to get a storm water sea going. And that's been 15, 20 years ago, but I think somebody took us to court and we couldn't do it. But we know we need to have a maintenance plan and or we got to have something. Uh, so I'm not trying to lay all of this on your feet at, at one time. It's going to take a combination. I think maybe a transportation, DWM, and maybe public work coming together and working it out and bringing something. <laughs> Um, I did want to say that you may want to contact the Latin American Association because you said you're reaching out to the Hispanic community. That's a wonderful organization, Latin American Association. I think they're on okay. for High. Okay. And so they may be able to provide, uh, you know, some people who may want to apply. Mm-hmm. Okay. The other... Yes is, and I know we're going to be cleaning up over there on Prior Street, right on the other side of Memorial Drive on this Thursday. So what I'm trying to find out, and I'm going to be there with you, I think Central Atlanta Progress is up there, and uh, I think I'm trying to get Georgia Works. So how are we going to, in terms of moving forward, we cannot have clothes and furniture sitting out for a month where our public is seeing this as they're looking downtown. That terrible image that we're presenting, you know, to the entire city, to the metro Atlanta area. And I know you're in the day, so there's only so much you can do. So my question goes back to a comment I made a couple of weeks ago about have we hired anybody or have we put out an RFP so we can get a company or two to help us with, with some dumping that's going on? Now, let me say this. I know that that was cleaned up before that area. And within two days, somebody came up and up again. So let me commend the department for cleaning it up. But some people are, people are actually bringing furniture into the city of one of my staff persons saw somebody on Mitchell Street at midnight bringing furniture to homeless folks. Okay, I want people to stop doing that. Stop doing that. Take it to the Atlanta Furniture Bank. Okay, Google the Atlanta Furniture Bank. They will come and pick up the furniture. And that's free furniture. So once people have gotten into a location, of not, and not under a bridge location, into an apartment building, then they will provide furniture. So please don't do that. You're jumping up our city. You're jumping up the metro Atlanta area. You is not jumping up Snellville. It may not be jumping up Alpharetta. It may not be jumping up Sandy Springs. But people are look they're not just looking at the city of Atlanta. They're looking at it as the metro Atlanta area is dirty. Okay? So please don't do that. You're not helping. You're hurting. So that's my question. Have we gotten anything done with um, with trying to hire some companies to help out public work? Well, well what we have, uh, thank you, Councilman, for those questions. Um, and certainly I echo uh, those sentiments with respect to you know accountability and folks dirtying up our community. Um, one of the things that we have done is engage more closely with the Georgia Department of Transportation. As, as you all know, many of these properties do fall on GDOT right away. And so so one of the things that we have done is, one, as we plan our encampment cleanups and things of that nature, GDOT does have an existing uh, contract with an external vendor. And I apologize, I don't know the name of that particular vendor. 
Um, but they do have that, that, that contract in place that they can actually uh, lay in on and, and, and address the, uh, some of the cleaning and beautification efforts. Well, I won't say beautification, but more so the cleaning efforts that may be required on and their respective property. But we are partnering more closely with them, and it's not just GDOT, but it's also Georgia Department of Public Safety, um, too. Um, as we get, unfortunately, you know, deeper into COVID, we don't have the resource of having the state inmates to come in and help with the physical and manual labor. And what I have learned in doing this work here recently is, is the fact that a lot of the cleanup efforts of people going out picking up in some, in, in some areas is described as, as, a, as a hazmat sort of a situation and so there's a specific training that people need to have and specific PPE that we're looking to looking into procuring to try to help um, make sure our employees have the, the proper tools and equipment to address this particular issue. But to answer your question more broadly, it's really about the relationship that we are really building building upon even further uh, with the Georgia Department of Transportation to really engage more holistically as opposed to kind of the one-off city of Atlanta you do and they're not the engagement necessarily, or court, I won't say engagement, but more so coordination with the Georgia Department of Transportation on the long-term approach. But you know, our, our stance is once we clean up these areas, the expectation is that it not get back the way that it is. And I think that that partnership is what's going to help this be a more long-term solution as opposed to a Band-Aid on the situation that we know is, is quite preventative. I got you. Okay. And, I, and I've got help from the department. That said, that not not that it's not their responsibility. I got an email from the state a couple of years ago. This issue was going off at them, kids. And you know what they said? And this is terrible. Do this to us. They said he can't do it. <laughs> the city of Atlanta, and they named at that time the box over jail. They named the Atlanta Police Department to come. They named public works. <laughs> Put it back on us. So I don't know what. They're not doing their job. Period. They said they can't do it. So I don't know. You know, once you move the homeless, they can do it. But even in the area where the homeless are in camp, they're not cleaning up. So I don't know how we rectify that because it doesn't make the state of Georgia look better than it does the city of Atlanta. So, so if they think the state's looking good, they're not. So I'm very upset about that. But this is an ongoing situation for years, okay? This is something. So I, I guess I'm just a little frustrated. Not I can do about it today, but my question is, in, uh, so then forget the, the State Department. In other areas where we need to <laughs> have we looked at hiring in private companies just temporarily when public work is not handle the load? And if you don't have an answer for me today, it's okay. But I, yes, I'm just saying continue to look into that because we're going to come into Another problem, we just can't have our city looking like this. We no, just can't. I, I... Yeah, I definitely understand. And so, I, and to your point, I, I don't have an answer for that today, given the fact that we've been really trying to address, you know, the issues of the, that we see and we've been dealing with um, with respect to engagement of private, you know, contractors to address the the, the right of way cutting and illegal dumping and bulk click up, bulk pickup. So that's been the primary area of focus. Um, yeah. But yeah, so that that has been a focus. So so no, man, we we have not holistically looked into that. But it certainly is not lost on on me or the leadership team on what the next steps need to be. And that's really long term planning and long term planning that we certainly need to start doing now. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for listening. And I, I don't mean to dump my garbage on you, top of you. Okay. I'll be out there Thursday. You know, I'll be out there to talk to you. Last question, Georgia, what, they do charge, but they have men that can help. Eight ways. Or do you want me to send you contact information? Yes, ma'am, that would be great. If you can, you can send that contact information, that would be great. Okay. Okay. Now I'll try to get a contact information for the Latin American Association. Okay? 
Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you for what you're doing because you are staying in touch with us and, you know, doing the best. I think you're doing, you're doing the best you can with what you have. Okay, so we appreciate that. I'm just yes, here. Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. I don't see any other speakers in the queue, so thank you, um, Deputy COO Johnson. Uh, and we will look forward to any follow up that you have here with the committee in between uh, your quarterly updates. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You're welcome. All right, uh, Jared, moving to our first, we have two papers. Would you please read those into the record? Item number two is 2016-94, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY2021 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Fund Budget in the amount of $10 million and zero cents to transfer funds from the Watershed Reserve for Appropriations and add funds to the most stormwater maintenance and restoration project and for other purposes. Item number three is 2016-95. An ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2021 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Budget in the amount of $333,266.40 to transfer funds from the Watershed Project Reserve for Appropriations and add funds to the Georgia Department of Transportation Utilities Municipal Intergovernmental Agreements Project and for other purposes. Sorry. We're moving to the next section, regular discussion J, ordinances for second reading. Uh, Madam Chair, would you like to take up the communication item number one or do that at a later time? No, no, no. I'm sorry. I uh, skipped over H. My bad. Please take that now. Okay. Item number one. 20C0111, a communication from Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms appointing Ms. Makita Browning to serve as Commissioner of the Department of Watershed Management for the City of Atlanta. All right. Uh, move approval, Madam Chair. So let's hear from Ms. Browning. Have to approve. Oh, oh. Um, that's fine. That's it. I'll second. Um, Ms. Browning, um, are you on the line? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Hey. I'd like to hear a little bit about um, right. the background. Absolutely. Um, the light. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of CUC. I'd like to thank all of you for your continued support, and I look forward to working with you. Um, and I would also like to thank Madam Mayor Bottoms for allowing me the opportunity to lead the department during this unprecedented time. Um, it is truly an honor and a privilege to lead the department. Um, as many of you may know or may not know, I'm a native of Lansing. I um, have lived, uh, grown up here and lived here all my life and um, take a lot of pride as being a, a native Lansing and, and being able to give back to a city that's given so much to me. And so as Commissioner of the Department of Watershed Management, I'm committed to ensuring the success of the department and leading our pursuit to becoming a leader among world-class utilities. Uh, top of mind for me is continuing to deliver the vital services to our citizens that we're tasked with providing on a daily basis 24-7. And a few priorities for me will be to ensure continue compliance with our consent decrees, ensure adequate system capacity to accommodate future growth and development. We'll look to, to implement smart policies and remedial measures to address flooding across the city, like to run an operationally and financially efficient utility. We like to retain and recruit talent to ensure that we have a strong and resilient workforce, looking to advance necessary CIP projects to ensure system resiliency and the long-term structural integrity of the collection and distribution, linear vertical assets, and lastly, to foster a positive culture that strives to deliver excellent and timely service uh, to the citizens of Atlanta. So I, I thank you for your continued support and the ability to continue to lead this department. We 
We do have a board member, I think, who wants to speak, or a council member, or is this from last time? Does someone want to speak? Because I. That's me, Chair Oman Archibald, Council Member Hills. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you, uh, Interim Commissioner Browning. Uh, I think we all uh, delivered some praise at the last meeting when, once the uh, announcement was made that you would be uh, uh, become the watershed commissioner. Uh, so I just wanted to reiterate that and thank you for your leadership, uh, many years of managing the consent decree program and as our assistant commissioner. And just again, uh, re reiterate my appreciation for your uh, your great staff. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Brett. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. And um, hi, Commissioner Browning. How long have you been with the Department of Watershed Management? Uh, this upcoming March will make 10 years. March 17th. Very, yeah. Very. Uh, thank you. I have two people. Uh, Mr. Schuck is next. Mr. Schiff? I was on mute. Thank you. Um, uh -huh. Go ahead. I just wanted to make, make sure, um, Madam Chair, that the Commissioner-elect um, understood that um, after this vote, there will be no recaps and no carrying of ballots. <laughs> <laughs> that I cannot say. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm forecasting my vote. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sam Shook. I appreciate it. All right. Well, I appreciate uh, Council Member Hillis reminding us that we've already heaped a lot of praise on you at the last meeting, so we can maybe move ahead. Oh, Ms. Shepard would like to uh, make some comments. Yes, ma'am. I just want to say congratulations. I look forward to working with you. Thank okay. you, Sam Shepard. Okay, if there's no one else, we've had a, a motion. Have we had a motion in the second? I think I seconded it, and um, Ms. Franklin made the motion. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, if there's no other debate, uh, please open the vote. The vote is open. Ms. Boone, how do you vote? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Vote is closed, seven yeas. All right, that is unanimous. As you know, um, this now moves to Committee on Council and then to full council. So thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, now Ms. Evans moving to our next section. Read the next paper, please. And you're gonna take four and six together. Yes, Madam Chair. Item number four. 2016-73, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2021 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Budget in the amount of $110,000.00 to transfer funds from the Watershed Project Reserve for appropriations and add funds to the Pool Creek Flood Study and for other purposes. Item number six. 20R4570, a resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizing the mayor or her designee to enter into a project partnership agreement with the United States Army Corps of Engineers to conduct a study to find long-term solutions to reduce flooding along Pool Creek in Southeast Atlanta in an amount not to exceed $110,000 and zero cents. All contracted work shall be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account number listed and for other purposes. All right, who's going to speak to us about these papers? Uh, Todd Hill, Department of Watershed Management. Good morning, uh, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, this is a much awaited agreement with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Last year in 2019, we were uh, notified of flooding in, on Hutchinson Road at Pool Creek, which caused widespread flooding, especially on the road and also actually flooding the entrance to South Atlanta High School. We did our investigations and determined that this was more of a regional type project that uh, we normally don't have funding for. And so we went to the Savannah District of the U mm -hmm. uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and uh, 
presented our case with all the data that we had collected on our investigation. And so this is a study to determine resolution projects that could be put in place to resolve some of the flooding air issues in this area and throughout this watershed. All right. Ms. Shepard has a question. Yes, ma'am. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all so much for doing this. Uh, uh, it was up. Well, it started with you all, the Watershed Department, and our previous Commissioner Powell, and the community South River Garden. Uh, that area had been flooding forever, and uh, so the fact that we went out there, I mean, it was getting to a point. It got so bad last uh, the year before last that. Uh, school buses got caught in, in the flood when it was raining on the way to school. It was just crazy. It was unbelievable. So it took us a series of calls and meetings to figure out whose responsibility was. We finally figured that out. Thank you all for your leadership in the watershed department. And the fact now you all talked to me and promised me a short-term solution. So you did the short-term solution even though we're still having a problem. The fact that we're now going to have money to look at a long-term solution and do a study of it. This is great. I can't wait to tell the South River Garden what we're doing. Uh, so we continue on. They just asked me about this last week. So thank you. And my motion, Madam Chair, is to support. Thank you. Um, so the motion has been seconded by Ms. Winslow. Thank you very much. If there's no other in readiness, please open the vote. The vote is open. Ms. Boone, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. The vote is closed, 78. All right, thank you. That stands approved. Next item. Item number 5, 20R4569, a resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizing the mayor or her designee to exercise renewal number one for FC 10387 large meter accuracy equipment and analytics with Olea Networks, Inc. on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management for a term of one year effective December 6, 2020 through December 5, 2021 in an amount not to exceed $498,869.00. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. All right, who's going to speak to us? Uh, this is Willie Ralph. Um, Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Is there a problem? We might have lost his connection. Okay, can you work on that? Oh, we can go to the next number. One moment. Okay. He has dropped off the call. All right, we will go to the next item and then come back when he comes back. Okay, that brings us to item number seven, 20 R 4571, a resolution by city utilities committee authorizing the mayor or her designee to execute agreements for RFPS 1200311, architectural engineering design and construction management services. Um, the RFP uh, A with Arcadis BPA joint venture a joint venture of Arcadis US Inc. and Brindley Peters and Associates Inc. The RFP B with the Atlanta Water Partners joint venture, a joint venture of Jacobs Project Management Company and Engineering Design Technologies Inc. RFP C with CDM Smith Benchmark joint venture, a joint venture of CDM Smith Inc. and Benchmark Management LLC. RFP D with FWR Joint Venture, a joint venture of Freeze and Nichols Inc., Wade Trim Inc., and Williams Russell and Johnson Inc., RFPE with H2 
R joint venture, a joint venture of Hazen and Sawyer PC and R2T Inc. and RFPF with HDR Rohead Fox joint venture, a joint venture of HDR Engineering Inc. and Rohead Fox Construction Control Services Corporation to provide architectural engineering design and construction management services to the Department of Watershed Management on a task order basis for an initial term of three years with two one-year renewal options and to add funding to a joint task order fund in an amount not to exceed $5 million and zero cents. Contracts to work shall be charged to and paid from the project and account number listed herein and for other purposes. All right, the colleagues, the request from the Department of Watershed Management is to hold this item and I make that motion to hold. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Hillis, for that second. If there's no other discussion, uh, let's open the vote. The vote is open. Ms. Hillis, how do you vote? Hold. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? In favor to hold. Thank you. The vote is closed at 78. All right, thank you. That stands uh, held. Now, did we find out if Mr. Wolf, I don't know how to pronounce his name, is he back yes. on the phone? We have been All joined right. by Mr. Wolf. All right. Uh, yes, sir, please go ahead and talk to us about item number five. 20 uh, or four. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, this is renewal number one of a three year contract. Um, this is the Aaliyah's Networks Renewal. Uh, Ali is a smart meter device that is installed on large meters to monitor meter health and its internal components. The data analytics helps the department to identify meters needed repair and prioritize work based on revenue loss. This also replaces our annual meter verification contract with COOTS, which expires this month. Um, and instead of being able to test one meter every 12 months, this renewal will allow us to test these meters on an ongoing basis with real-time data analytics. This technology further supports the large meter testing program that's practices and recommendations by the Georgia Association of Water Professionals, as well as the American Water Works Association. We began this contract deploying 700 devices as a pilot. We've since been able to capture $3.8 million as a result of analysis and the subsequent meter repairs. This is the result of this proof of concept. We're in the process currently of installing an additional 1,600 devices, which you all voted on in the budget amendment in September. So with that, I would ask the support of this renewal. Chief, Chief, Chief. 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 Second, Hill. All right, thank you. Are there any questions from any colleagues? It's been properly moved and seconded. Uh, see no speakers in the queue, so please open the vote. The vote is open. Ms. Boone, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? In favor. All right, thank you. The vote is closed at seven yes. All right, thank you. That stands approved. Uh, now we move to our held item uh, number 13. Ms. Evans, please read that item. Item number 20-0-1498. An ordinance by City Utilities Committee to amend the Atlanta City Code Part 2 General Ordinances Part 74 Environment Article 10 Post Development Stormwater Management to implement new regulatory requirements. To improve and clarify processes to update references, definitions and make other drafting amendments and for other purposes. There's a substitute, the current substitute um, yeah. uh, is, uh, 
been submitted. So we need to do procedural motion to bring that substitute forward. Is that correct? That is correct. And the caption is unchanged. All right, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Hill, move to bring the substitute forward. I'll second that. Uh, can we open that vote? Ms. Boone, how do you? Thank you, sir. Ms. Boone, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? Okay. What does the substitute do? I'm sorry. They're going to bring it forth and then they're going to talk about it. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, yes. Yeah. Okay. In favor. All right. Thank you. Oh, all right. The vote is closed. It's seven yes. Thank you very much. The substitute is now before us. Who from Watershed Management is going to talk to us about the substitute? Uh, Todd Hill, Department of Watershed Management. Yes, sir. Proceed. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first up, in 2019, uh, the Georgia Environmental Protection Division uh, notified uh, the city and all stakeholders about the uh, about the uh, upcoming changes to the MS4 permit. And since that time, we developed a ordinance committee that went through line by line of the proposed new permit and line by line of the ordinance to see how it affects and make the necessary changes. And with that, we realized that not only were there regulatory requirements, but that we also had uh, language in our current ordinance that was obsolete, that needed to be updated, as well as clarification to the ordinance that made the ordinance easier to read and understand. Uh, changes to the ordinance that are required for regulatory requirements uh, were requiring linear transportation projects, streets, sidewalks, and paths for activities beyond regular maintenance uh, to be included to provide stormwater management. This is not in our court current ordinance before. And so we have worked closely with the with uh, ATL DOT on um, preparing a required linear transportation project feasibility policy that has to be reviewed and approved by the Environmental Protection Division uh, that allows for reduced compliance standards based on the nature of the project and defines hardship. And these standards and policies must be uh, in place by the end of the year. Also, the other regulatory requirement that was made was that large infill single-family residential developments greater than 5,000 square feet of new impervious surface must now meet all the stormwater management standards, including detention requirements for the MS4 permit. Uh, then, uh, as far as our housekeeping issues, we removed unnecessary terms, added clarifying definitions, and uh, reorganized provisions to improve the layout and readability of the ordinance. We also clarified existing standards and processes based on lessons that we've learned from applicants applying for permits and actually trying to interpret the permits and so our ordinance. And so it's making it easier for the development community to understand what they have to do in the process. Uh, we clarified the alternative compliance process for sites that find it impossible to meet the entire runoff reduction required by the green infrastructure volume of one inch that's supposed to stay on site. There are cases where there's contaminants on site or the site is just not conducive to providing these. And so right now, uh, developers have to uh, in to submit an alternative compliance report to the to site development for review and approval. And that is where they provide all the data and documentation, including a permeability test showing that they cannot meet the requirement. And when we review that now, we require them, we work with them to try to get them to try to meet a portion of the green infrastructure requirement until they can't. And right now we've clarified that showing the tiered system on how it works so that they developers can better understand what they need to bring to the table when they're doing the alternative runoff reduction feasibility reports to us. Uh, we added uh, 
requirement for sewer capacity clarification to codify an existing policy that for sites served by the combined sewer system. Right now, anything that you, anytime you tie into our combined sewer system, you have to get a sewer availability, sewer capacity certification. Uh, we added master plan provisions that will allow for a more streamlined permitting process for multi-phase pro projects. This is allowing flexibility for the development community where if their first phase is a phase that can't meet all the requirements of the current ordinance, as long as they're not increasing runoff off the site, they can go ahead and put that first phase in based on how their master plan shows that they're going to meet the requirements of the ordinance once they finish out that last phase. Uh, we also uh, extended the performance bond requirements from one year to three years. We've had a history of uh, actually having stormwater management uh, systems that have been put in that aren't functioning correctly and based off their design or how they were constructed. And these, uh, this bond allows us to go back on it because sometimes it's not causing a threat to the public and some of this is from subdivisions themselves that are required for maintaining, but their discharge points could be causing downstream flooding to residents. And it just allows us to utilize that bond because in a lot of cases, when we go and investigate these issues and the bond has expired, we have, we have to tell the customer, your flooding is a private matter and you're going to have to take, get up with the property owner and that may require you to take civil action. So this is just allowing to make sure that there is enough time for that. Uh, Another thing that we're doing is uh, there have been questions about the new requirement for the 5,000 square foot uh, uh, limits for single family homes. Uh, right now, under our current ordinance, uh, they only have to meet the one inch requirement. Now they'll be re required to put in full detention systems. And so as part of our guidance to our customers, once this ordinance is passed, we will be putting out a, a actual guidance on 5,000 square foot single family residential so that uh, our customers can know the steps that they'll have to take in order to move forward. Also, this linear transportation policy will be the other guidance for linear projects that we're working with ATLDOT on. Uh, with that, I'm glad to entertain any questions that you might have. I'm right back. I'm here to my mom's house now. All right. And, uh, thank you very much for that overview. Any questions for uh, Mr. Hill? Let me see if I have anybody in the queue. Okay. So let me ask them a few questions. So Can I have some? Okay, is that Ms. Winslow? Yeah, but I was waiting. If there's somebody that's already signed up, that's why I like to wait because I'm not, you know, you don't know I want to speak, so I want to be respectful of those that have already signed up. Well, guess what? You're the first one, so go ahead. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So let, let me ask a couple of questions because I think they overheard me earlier saying you almost have to have a feel like I have to have a PhD, <laughs> you know, uh, to get through some of this. So what are the, what's the state requirement for us meeting our goal? And so it, and is that within this documentation? I see a lot of uh, redlining. Uh, you know, um, so help me out with that, Mr. Hill. Okay, I'll what be glad to. What does the state require? Okay, the state requires uh, for linear transportation projects, roads, uh, sidewalks, and uh, paths to uh, meet all our stormwater ordinance requirements. Right now, they're from the stormwater ordinance requirements. That's one of them. The other is uh, on the okay, water. So, so tell, so what part 
we, we've got almost 75 pages worth of information and the pages are not numbered. So what, well, you can't tell me what page it's on, but, but go ahead. That would help if I knew what page that was on. I would no, I cannot tell, tell you right off on the package. No, no I'm just saying, I, because it's not numbered. Okay. But, uh, but that's one of the requirements. Okay. That's I'm one of the you. requirements. And that has more of an impact on ATL DOT than on the private community. And we've worked closely with them on the standards that are required and uh, the exemption required, what, where they can be exempt. Because we understand that there are going to be cases on the roads where, and paths and sidewalks where it's not feasible for them to put in some form of either green infrastructure or stormwater management system, uh, such as enlarged pipes to detain uh, flow off the roadways. Uh, because of the conditions that they're in. So it's a case-by-case -case basis that's done on review. The other item is on these large infill houses. That's where uh, uh, someone buys a lot with a small house on it and they want to put a big house on it, a big mega mansion. And for those that are five, that, that, that cause 5,000 square feet of impervious area, that's the house footprint as well as driveways, patios, et cetera, then they have to now, right now before this new ordinance goes into effect, they only have to catch the first one inch of rainfall in green infrastructure on their property. Now they have to put in detention systems just like a commercial project would require where they have to put in a a uh, detention pond, a uh, detention vault, uh, additional green infrastructure, but they're going to have to meet all those requirements. And those are the two items that are required. So those are required by the state? Correct. And if we're not in compliance with that, that is up to a $50,000 a day fine from the state. Okay, plus, and I'm sorry, go ahead. Plus uh, loss of other, potential loss of other state benefits such as grants and loans. Okay, so those are the two things that are required. Okay, so, so, so beyond that, what are some of the other things that are in here? Okay, that the other things that are required. First that off, aren't required. Part of it is that we went through and rearranged the ordinance so it was easier to read. We clarified definitions. There were a lot of definitions that were no longer uh, pertinent, and there were other definitions that needed to be revamped and some definitions that needed to be added. Uh, then we uh, went back to... Uh, then we clarified, like when a applicant cannot put in the green infrastructure that's required by the ordinance for the first one inch of rainfall, uh, uh -huh. they have to go through an alternative runoff reduction process, meaning that they have to do all these studies. They have to get a geotech out, geotechnical firm out to the site to do borings and do percolation tests. They have to do environmental tests and they have to submit that report to us showing why they can't meet the requirements. And, okay. we require to, and we review that. And we, as the department in site development, review that and we determine whether that is okay or not, if they've shown a suitable hardship. But in the process, we work with them as we look at it because our design professionals see so many of these, they can provide some guidance and say, hey, you can uh, look at, look, you have this area where you're going to put street trees in. You can put green infrastructure with that tree, street tree and provide a tree well for stormwater runoff. It may not get all of it, but it'll get part of it. And then the difference between the runoff that you can't make, you can do the alternative runoff reduction design where they're just going to add, add more detention probably to their detention vault usually is what happens. And 
when they make this request for the alternative runoff reduction, it's reviewed by staff, and then they're sent to me for final sign-off so that we can make sure that we're consistent on how we determine uh, the interpretation of the ordinance and the application of allowing them to move forward with that alternative runoff reduction. Uh, the other thing is that we uh, increase the bond requirement from one year to three years. Uh, I've had several cases as deputy commissioner over the Office of Watershed Protection to have to go out and look at a lot of flooding. I do it a lot. And I meet with residents. And there have been t several instances where there has been a development that's been built that the way the runoff is coming off, it's flooding them. And it might have met the intent of the ordinance, but it's not functioning correctly. And what happens is uh, that's not something that we did as a city. It's not the city right away that's causing this. This is a stormwater management system that a development put in. And right now, if it's not in the first year where we can go back on that bond to have that work done to their detention system to help stop the flooding for the downstream neighbors, then what happens is we have to tell that person that's complaining to us about their house is flooding, their basement flooding, uh, that, uh, that it's a civil matter, it's not a city matter, and they'll have to take it up with the property owner that has that uh, stormwater management system. So basically, uh, the homeowner is having downstream is having to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to try to get this fixed. And uh, so we just wanted to allow enough time that we're able to actually determine that there have been enough large rain events that that uh, that allows us to see that that's not the case, that it is functioning correctly and it was installed and designed correctly. And then we had another one in the combined sewer system uh, where we just are making it very clear, and this is already in the other code, in the code of ordinances and other places. We're just making it very clear that if you're tying your detention system outfall into our combined sewer system, you have to get a sewer capacity uh, letter showing that that the combined sewer system has capacity to take the stormwater runoff. Because the last thing we want to have are sewer spills because of the connection from a detention system to the combined sewer system. Okay, so so this substitute is more basic. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay, so we, it's more streamlined is what I'm what I'm I'm getting from you. Yes, ma'am. And the other thing is the original <laughs> ordinance that we had in there was uh, was a had a 48-hour extended detention requirement. Uh, we've had comments from the public that it needs to be more stringent. We've had a lot of the public that liked what we were doing. And then uh, we've had the development. The host has joined the conference. Uh, the, we've had the development community uh, show concerns about additional costs from the extended detention. So we put that on hold and taken it out of this version of the ordinance so that we okay. can do additional studies, okay. engineering studies, look at what other municipalities are doing addressing this, and we can have good stakeholder discussions that include both the homeowner resident as well as the development community so that we can have a good dialogue and make a decision based on detailed engineering analysis. So that is something oh. that we will come back with in the future before the CUC with proposed changes, but not at this time until we do a, uh, okay. a additional study. Okay, okay, all right. That's what I was trying to understand. Okay, so I, that that makes sense to me. And it, So right now what we're doing is making sure that we come in compliance with with our with the state because we have to do that by the end of the year is that correct 
Correct. Well, we have yes. to have the ordinance in place by December 10th. By and December then we have 10th. to have the linear transportation policy in place by the end of the year. And okay. the only main difference between this ordinance and the existing ordinance is yes, linear sir. transportation requirement and the 5,000 square foot single family homes. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same. Okay, okay, okay. So that, okay, I feel more comfortable now. I, I, I wasn't clear on it earlier, but you gave a very basic explanation. So we can come back later and if we need to do some other things, we can do that. But right now we're just dealing with the basics of what has to be done for us to come with in, compli come to in, in compliance with the state so that we don't get fined zillions of dollars. Correct, as well as some clarifications in housekeeping on the old ordinance, just so that it's more streamlined and it clarifies what the intent of the ordinance is. Okay, all right, thank you for that explanation. I feel more comfortable with, with what you said, it makes sense. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you're welcome, um, and thank you uh, for that overview. On the extended detention, we heard uh, a lot of public comment about that, and I had an opportunity to talk to um, Interim Commissioner Browning about that. Are you on the phone, um, Commissioner Browning? Yes, ma'am, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. If you go yes. over the different watersheds, I thought that was uh, pretty interesting. So we, we received quite a bit of feedback concerning the extended detention time, and that is a component of the ordinance that we will look to proceed with um, implementing in the future. We just wanted to put a pause on it temporarily and do additional engineering analysis, have a look at the data, and really determine what's appropriate across the city because we feel that, you know, we, we've got 10 watersheds, 10 sewer basins, the makeup and topography and, and amount of impervious surfaces is different across the city. So we want to make sure that we're being very thoughtful and we look at the different thresholds that may be needed dependent on, you know, the different um, locations and, and watersheds throughout the city. So we want to allow a little bit more time to, you know, over the next several months to do more modeling, do more analysis, and determine what's appropriate. And so that's our intention. We definitely feel that um, a component for extended detention is needed, and it's something that we definitely want to look to amend the ordinance and include um, in, the near, in the near future. And we'll hopefully be able to bring forth um, some options for consideration. We will definitely engage internal and external stakeholders to have thoughtful conversations about what those thresholds and what it needs to look like. Um, and, and look to bring forth an amendment again um, in the next six months or so. Okay, and one of the things that um, you mentioned was certain watersheds have very unique and different requirements and needs and being sensitive to that is um, an objective as well. And so I appreciate uh, that. Uh, I see, and I do have a couple other questions, but I see uh, my colleague Justin Hillis has a question. So I'll defer to Mr. Hillis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and my I guess, comments were just uh, what you had mentioned and what uh, Commissioner Browning brought up is uh, generally support you know, the extended detention, but I was, you know, very confused as to, you know, the initial uh, ordinance was kind of stroking the whole city with a with a broad brush when there's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, different areas of the city have different issues. You know, we heard a lot uh, uh, from people uh, in Summer Hill and Mechanicsville and areas that have a lot of issues with street flooding. Um, but if you look at, you know, places like District 9, we don't have as much of those, those issues. So um, it, it's, am I correct in understanding that the city is going to reevaluate this and, and come up with kind of different requirements uh, or recommendations uh, for the different areas of the city, maybe by watershed? Yes, Tim Hill said that is the plan and intention to, to look at each of the different, the 10 different watersheds individually and determine the appropriate thresholds for the detention. 
Understood. Thank you. Okay. Um, in looking at the uh, substitute uh, section, let's see. Gosh, we have turned so many pages. What was this? Section uh, seventy-four dash thirteen, and then. Section J, number six. It's at the top of the page. Find it. It's right above section seventy-four five one four. That would have been a quicker way to find it. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm pulling that part of the ordinance up. It's right before section 514. Correct. And it, am, am I correct that this is not part of the minimum, that this is something that has been added? Oh, yes. Um, uh, basically, uh, so, what has so, happened... Well, we, have a, we, have a, we have like a yes or a no question on the table so far. Is this something that's been added or was this part of the minimum? Uh, this is something that was added to just kind of do oh. coordination between uh, having trees so, removed over storm let me, water. Uh, let me ask my question. So we have a tree protection ordinance pretty wide. We have a lot of sensitivities and concerns around this. And I would like for us to have protections in place already and you have state minimums in place already and I would like for us to have the tree protection ordinance and this work done in concert and not just sort of a one-off fragment approach. So my recommendation would be to delete. We have protections in place and we need to do more and we in CDA to, to get that. So, um, if, if we already have protections for trees, you already have state minimums that are working on Improving that, let's not get to the middle of it right now. Let's let the protection ordinance be mindful of what we're doing here as we work toward uh, finalizing what our tree protection ordinance uh, will look like. Does that make sense? Make sense to me? Uh, I'm to remove it. Uh, I see where you're going, uh, Councilmember Archibong. Uh, this was done in conjunction with the planning department. But the planning department and gotten all of the input and what we're going to do with the tree protection or that but now we're at a policy body and i'm just being respectful of the process where we're trying to look at it holistically i appreciate that you talk to the department but this is bigger and it's an ongoing conversation yes ma'am uh we have no objections to uh that waiting the uh, tree protection ordinance goes in place. That would be my motion. And I see, um, Ms. Hill, are you speaking to this motion? But it hadn't been seconded yet. But that was. Uh, yes, I'll. Second. Uh, okay. Okay, I heard. Uh, Winslow. Thank you, Ms. Winslow. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hillard. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I will just uh, echo your concerns. Um, you know, if this is something that uh, needs to be looked at or is recommended to be looked at by the planning department and that needs to be addressed uh, with them uh, and through uh, CDHS and through the tree protection ordinance rewrite which we are very uh, anxiously awaiting um, here on city council so uh, Absolutely. support support this motion all right uh, any other comments if not we'll open the code on the motion to amend for the purpose of removing that provision for now. Madam Chair, for my clarity, this is uh, section 74.513, subsection J, and then Number subsections six. one through six all underneath of that. No, just six. Just six, okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh no, thank you for asking. One moment, we'll open the vote. 
The vote yeah. is up. Ms. Boone, how do you vote? Ms. Boone? Yes, Madam right. Chair, can you hear me? I was muted. Okay, are you in support of it? Yes. All right, thank you very much. All right, the vote is closed at 78. All right, thank you. Uh, the paper as amended now before us. Are there any other questions? I, I second your your, uh, I'll second if you're if you're making a motion, Madam Chair. I'll second you, Winslow. Or I'll make a motion to as amended and substitute it. Ooh, oh no, yeah. we're just doing the amendment, right? No, no, no. You were right to say a substitute. Not about that. The oh. paper oh. as amended substitute. Oh, okay. That's my motion. Second, Boone. All right, it's been moved and seconded by Boone. Uh, let's see my, hang on my computer. Okay, I'm back. There's no other unreadiness. Uh, we can open. Vote is 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 open. The vote is closed at 78. All right, thank you. That stands approved. Uh, do we have any other items uh, for consideration today? No, Madam Chair, that concludes the business. All right, thank you, colleagues. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. All right. All right, thank you. I said that. Thank you, colleagues. Good meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Good meeting. Thank you. Okay.